And there's another new African project on Netflix. That's The Barrio of Kojo, which is a tale of family tensions with an overlay of magical realism set in Ghana. It is the first feature from Bliss Bazaule, a Ghana-born rapper and director who crowdfunded the project. From Los Angeles, VOA's Michael Sullivan has this story. The Burial of Kojo is the story of a girl, her father, and his brother. One of the brothers goes missing on a mining expedition, and his daughter has to go on this magical journey to rescue him. A journey that blends dreams and reality. Bazawule started as a rapper, then moved into visual storytelling. He takes his audience beyond the usual cliches in this film set in Ghana making a film on the continent of Africa that doesn't revolve around the tropes that we know. So the war, the famine, these are the films that are very uh, disproportionately uh, produced as it relates to Hollywood and the continent. The film was shot with a Ghanaian cast and local crew. He raised $78,000 on Kickstarter to help fund it. I always say that it gave us the autonomy that we needed. Right, so we didn't have anybody looking over our shoulder. We didn't have anybody telling us what to do, what not to do. It was always us deciding with ourselves, does this make sense for this narrative? The film is distributed by Array, a Hollywood company founded by filmmaker Ava DuVernay. It is being shown on Netflix. You know, Netflix is in 190 countries. So that's a lot of places, you know, where you can find beautiful work and where movie makers can find an audience. Because out of that audience, then, you build credibility for the stories that you're telling. Bringing new stories to the screen. Mike O'Sullivan, VOA News, Los Angeles. And joining me in studio is my colleague, Azuma Kamporic, talk to me about this movie and what it means that African films are able to get on these platforms. Azuma, where are you originally from? From Burkina Faso. From Burkina Faso. So, you know Burkina Faso uh, Burkina is Faso. by Sparkle, <laughs> Absolutely, right? Absolutely. Uh, the home of African uh, film. Azuma is a storyteller, filmmaker, also reporter here at The Voice of America. We attended the premiere of The Barrio of Koja together in Silver Spring here in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, let's stress the journey of this movie from being a crowdfunded project mm -hmm. to ending up on Netflix. How did it get there? Well, it's... It all started with first building a community. You already said, you know, Bliss the Ambassador has a huge followership. He's already a musician, so mm. he has people that like what he does. And he, he, he capitalized on that. You know, today, Kickstarter, you know, uh, GoFundMe, Indiegogo, mm. all those platforms allow people like that that has, you know, followership to capitalize on right. it. So that's basically what he did. They put together a nice, nicely put uh, campaign and they were able to raise 70 something 72,000 dollars right to like to actually start the movie right. you know the movie was cost a lot more than that but that alone when you have that you already know there are certain things that you won't need permission to do right. because you know you can afford Absolutely. to do those things so you have like cre the creative uh, uh, freedom. The freedom to to do whatever you want mm -hmm. Unlike if you say got money from a Hollywood studio to fund, uh, and and that's the problem, I guess, a, an issue that many African storytellers have to deal with is that if you get funding from a studio, there are certain elements mm -hmm. or aspects of your movie that uh, of the story that you might have to get rid of just to fit with uh, the demands of the studio. So there's two sides. Right. You know, of course, you're gonna have that, you know, uh, sense of you know control. But it always depends on how you, 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 negotiate, you negotiate with, yeah, right. you know, with the, the, the studio. Right. Because they can actually allow more freedom. Right, they can right. actually allow you to do crazier things. Because they can put the right money, your amount of money, into the mm -hmm. project. So let's not but, forget that. But you, as an African filmmaker, do you think you have that kind of uh, freedom uh, uh, to negotiate with the studios? If you have a story they don't trust you, they don't know you that well, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a struggle already just to have access to these type of funding but also having the ability to negotiate with them about certain aspects of your story that you feel very strongly about. 
So, have you ever had to have these conversations? Actually, I started mm -hmm. um, the conversation with a couple of producers back in the days. I remember when I was actually shooting my thesis film, um, Hawa, uh, back in uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, I had to actually do like start from scratch from scratch because mm. I came here I had no base I had I didn't know nobody mm. yet I had to make a movie that costed about sixty thousand right. dollars to make that's it, a it, lot it, of money and it's a short movie right so what I learned you know through the process is that when you're in the film industry when you're a director or a storyteller in general it's all about creativity it's all about how you approach absolutely how are you going to overcome the process. you know all those and obstacles so, so also even negotiating is a creative it's process. a creative process <laughs> because guess what in order for you to have to to, to catch somebody's attention or produce attention mm. you need to come up right you need to come up like Okay, this guy, okay, I can bet but on him. But is there as a hesitation, is there a hesitation from funders if you're an African solitaire? Who is doing, is making the movie, that not really matter. Mm. What's the movie is about, that's what matters. So if I'm making a movie where I'm talking about, you know, my village, for an audience in America, no producer is going to be excited about it because right. it doesn't tickle right. with the American audience. Because at, at, at the end of them, it's the bottom line. Bottom line. Yeah. How, many, how many eyes are going business. to be attracted to the screens to watch this exactly. and then I'll be able to recoup my money that I invested in the movie? That's business, right? <laughs> that's, the business, that's money talk right so, there. So let me ask you this. I know we, we don't have a lot of time and you know we could have a, a longer conversation with you. Uh, Azuma, Azuma Kampori is, uh, is a filmmaker here, best in Washington, D.C., but also here, my colleague at The Voice of America. So I enjoy having this kind of conversations with you um, is is what is the advantage of having an access to a platform like Netflix for an African filmmaker visibility you know you have access to uh, millions of, of, of audience and actually you know Netflix is starting to really be more aggressive like you said on Africa I you know recently heard about the new uh, uh, production manager uh, in charge of Africa con content it's, mm. she's from Kenya uh, I'm not recalling her name right now, but that's a great move. It means that they, they recognize that there's a potential. And then, you know, people, you know, want to see those kind of movies. too. Mm. They want to be educated. For a long time, the only reason why Africa filmmaking was not known in the world is because there was no production. We were not competing at that production level. Not, let's, don't even talk about the quality, just existing. You, it was very hard to right. find a good movie online right. or like on a movie theater. But today, you see that it is there. Why do you think that you know, um, South Korea movies are making good? Right. Why do you think that China movies are making good? Because the production is there. Mm. So now that they understand that, okay, if we have production, we have more choices, right. then we're going to have a better chance to have high quality production. Speaking, speaking of production, uh, the production quality on this movie was amazing. And amazing. We're talking about Barry of Kojo. The movie yeah. was done under $100,000. I believe he was able to, to you say, uh, uh, crowd, so, crowdfund so, about seventy or $80,000. Mm -hmm. But the movie has the production value of about a million dollars and more. Given the technology these days, does it matter how much uh, you, you throw behind the movie? Um, if you have a solid story. If you have a solid story, that's what you need. To be honest, mm. the story is always first. You need to have a solid plot line, a solid, you know, you know, something that grips people from beginning to end. That's number one. After that, the move, the, the, like we talked about it, it's a business thing. It doesn't matter if you have the greatest movie, but you're not able to push it out there so people can see. Mm. So marketing is going to play a big role. We saw that with you know, uh, 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 Black Panther. You know, the marketing you know, strategy that mm. they put together mm. is part of the success of the movie today, mm. right? Because they made it part of everybody's culture. Yeah, like, they, they made it part of the culture. Like, exactly. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's one thing. Sometimes when you see independent filmmakers, they're not, they don't tend to you know, spend enough time in On thinking, thinking about those, other about those aspects. Right. And frankly, that's not their job. You know, uh, uh, companies like Array that Ava DuVernay or DuVernay owns, mm. that's their job. Because that's, you know, they, they see the value of the product and they can capitalize on it. They can make sure that this product becomes viable and profitable. Mm. Not only through, you know, a, a broader, you know, uh, exposure. Well, why do you think Ava DuVernay decided to uh, uh, take on this project under her umbrella? 
Well, she, she actually, uh, for the past couple of years, you know, started to uh, call for, you know, original productions. And of course, she's, you know, very interested in, uh, you know, Africa and uh, African production in general. So I think, you know, part of it's a combination because like, you know, uh, Blitz the Ambassador was talking about, you know, he just happened to know a uh, couple of people that were in the circle of Eva DuVernay. Mm. So that helped him to actually right, to introduce the attention. movie, right? right? So like I said, you have to have prior you know, predicament right. so that the, you know, the producer is going as, to as a, as a filmmaker yourself, what type of, when you watch this movie, The Barrier of Kojo, what kind of, uh, uh, of creative freedoms did you see uh, uh, bliss taking and you say, you, like, you, you, you say to yourself like, you know, I would have loved to make that movie and do exactly that. Or those, that is the one element about African film that was lacking, whether it's from the score, whether it's from the actors, the choice of actors. We know that some of the big uh, uh, film projects that are about African stories and Af African characters use foreigners. And also the studios are the ones usually who will tell you which actors, which, who are the what lead the, actors mm -hmm. based on their marketability. But what kind of uh, creative freedoms you, did you see uh, on this project that, that resonated with you? So first, the language. When we speak in English, we think a certain way. When he speaks in, in, you know, in his mother tongue, mm. he thinks a different way. What I'm trying to say is African languages or dialects have a particular set of you know, rules that you need to understand in order to decode the meaning behind things, right? Mm. So we're talking about reinventing cinematographic language. So far, a lot of people, they just, you know, do the movies based on you know the basic concept that you know they, they learn in school or they learn watching other movies but when you think about it the way you tell a story is based on the way you or the, the society you're part of is you know conceive telling a story and he says it himself he's he's based his you know the burial of kojo for example on how his mom his grandma used to tell him stories and if you watch the movie, he says something at the beginning. He says, those are the kind of stories where you won't understand the movie until you watch the end. Right. Yeah, so you won't understand the meaning of certain things until you actually understand or hear some of the words at the end to actually connect the dots. So that's the kind of freedom that you know, I, I love seeing when I watch African you know, uh, movies. Language is important. Language, how and you actually is... reappropriate yourself, mm. that cinematographic language, to make it your own. So it belongs to you, so it looks like you. That's, my, that's what absolutely, I'm saying. Absolutely, absolutely. So you actually had a chance to talk to Bleeds. Uh, what did you talk to him, what did you ask him? So I asked him a few questions. The first one was you know, where, where he gets his uh, inspiration from. And uh, he said that he, he's actually, you know, tapping into, you know, a lot of the stories that his grandma used to tell him. And, um, you know, maybe we can take a look at uh, right. what he says. Let, let's watch it. As a filmmaker, you know, my stories come from, you know, sitting around by the fireside at night, nocturnal, listening to what my grandmother was telling us. And her stories were always magical. Her stories were always um, very imaginative. And so making a film like The Barrel of Kojo, it's, it's a great opportunity for me to bring her ideas to life, you know? We have so much richness in terms of our storytelling, in terms of our identity, our culture, our colors. These are things that make us who we are. And for me, this was a great opportunity to show uh, the multiple layers of Africanness, of Ghanaianness, and also be specific about um, how you know, we, we feel about each other, you know, outside of what the Western gaze may be or the outside gaze may be. So this is this was a big opportunity for me. That was Bliss the Ambassador, the man behind uh, the Barrio of Kojo movie showing currently on Netflix. I'm in the studio with Azuma Kampore, my colleague here at The Voice of America. He's also a filmmaker. Uh, Azuma, as we end our conversation today, uh, what do you see as the future of African cinema right now? I see more movies, more images, more sounds, more music, more cultures, more laughs, more laughter, more you know, tears. Mm. I see more of Africa on the screens because technology is making it available. It's you know, a huge uh, population in Africa, al almost you know, one billion mm. soon, mm. and like a good chunk of it is 
people like kids under 30. I say kids because, you know, we, we, we like to play. And when those people, you know, understand the power that making movie right. have, everything is going to be just, uh, you know, magical. So you're very optimistic I'm about very it. Optimistic I'm very excited, very excited as a filmmaker. It, as a Azuma, filmmaker. thank you very much for coming in and talking to us about Anytime. African Anytime. film. Anytime. Thank you very much. That was Azuma Kampore. You can check him out online. Uh, follow him on uh, social media. What is uh, your social media handle, Azuma? Just type for Azuma Kampari. Azuma Kampari. Okay. Any, any film projects that people should look out for? Well, there's a couple of projects. There's that are a, underway. It's, we'll it's have underway. you in here. You'll we'll talk to us about it. We'll talk about it. My man, thank you very much. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs>